This is the story of a man who sporadically murdered innocent civilians under the guise of starting a revolution. And that begs the question, just how large a bloodbath did this man actually draw? Well, you are about to find out. Welcome or welcome back to Twisted Minds. My name is James and today we'll be looking at the case of Anders Bering Breivik. Anders was born on February 13, 1979 in Oslo to Venke Bering and Jens David Breivik. Venke, Anders' mother, was a nurse. His father, Jens, was a civil economist who occupied the office of a diplomat for the Norwegian Embassy, first in London and then in Paris. Venke had run away from home at the age of 17 because she was suffering from abuse. Not too long after she fled home, she became a mother in her teenage years. However, it wasn't until her 30s that she met Jens, and the two got married. Anders was born shortly after. Before Anders was born, it was said that Venke had a particular dislike for him. She said that Anders was a nasty child who enjoyed kicking her unnecessarily. Initially, Venke thought that it would be best if she aborted the child, but she could not because she had already gone past her first trimester when she returned to Norway from the United Kingdom. Venke described Anders as a fundamentally nasty and evil child whose heart was set on destroying her. Taking all that into consideration, it shouldn't come as a surprise that Anders did not enjoy the benefits that came with being an infant, as his mother stopped breastfeeding him very early, since she believed that he was sucking the life out of her. Anders was only 12 months old when his parents got separated. They had been living in London at that time. Venke left London after her separation from Jens and moved to Oslo's Frogner district. In 1981, Venke made an application to enable her to get welfare benefits, particularly in terms of finance. Later in 1982, she made another application, this time seeking respite care for Anders, saying it was overwhelming to take care of him. In the application, she said he was too demanding and very clingy. Following this report, Anders was then placed under child welfare services. Fortunately for the youngster, a young couple decided to take him in. but. They expressed their concerns after what Venke had said to them. Venke was supposed to bring Anders to the young couple, but on dropping him off, she had pleaded with them to allow Anders to touch the penis of the man so he could at least have someone to compare with when it comes to appearance. Venke said that Anders was only used to seeing the pee holes of his opposite sex. In case you are confused about what you just heard, you are not alone. Following this rather disturbing encounter, it is unclear what became of the arrangement with the young couple. What we do know, however, is that barely a year later, Anders was back together with his abusive mother. In February 1983, neighbors advised Venke to bring Anders to the National Center for Child and Adolescent Psychiatry for a diagnosis. Venke and Anders were outpatients. In the course of the diagnosis, psychologists filed various reports concerning the mental health of Anders. In one of the reports, a psychologist had said that Anders' smile was hardly triggered by his emotions, but mainly because he had taught himself to respond that way to his surroundings. Another report raised concerns about how Venke constantly sexualized Anders, how she would always hit him and often told him that it would be best if he had just died. One particular report described Venke as someone who had a pretty difficult upbringing and a borderline personality disorder, and someone who, projects her primitive, aggressive, and sexual fantasies onto her son. Psychiatrists had recommended that Anders be taken out of his mother's care and placed in a foster home instead, since she often abused him emotionally and psychologically. They said that it was necessary for Anders to be taken under the arms of the foster care system rather than staying with his mother to enable him to experience normal childhood development. Growing up, Anders showed barely any emotion, and psychologists connected that to the fact that he probably got negative emotions from his mother whenever he displayed any form of emotion. For example, a psychologist had studied him and discovered that he always wanted his toys arranged in a certain way, and that he was always anxious whenever they weren't. According to Venke, Anders was not as organized as he presented himself to be. She said she would always run after him trying to put things in order. Hence, the psychologist concluded that Anders probably became organized because he was scared of what his mother would do if he wasn't. It worried them, especially because it was normal for a four-year-old to exhibit some form of disorderliness. 
but Anders always seemed controlled. Plus, he was usually very careful. Another trait that was very unusual for a four-year-old was the fact that Anders barely engaged the emotional part of him. No one could tell whether he was happy or sad. Unlike children his age who cry when they feel pain, Anders never did. For the most part, he kept to himself and never played with other children. For all these reasons, psychologists and psychiatrists kept hammering on the need to remove Anders from his mother's care, especially since his existence continually provoked his mother Venke. Despite all these recommendations, child welfare services did not come for Anders. The closest Anders got to being away from his mother was being in respite care, and that was barely enough for him to develop properly since he was only taken on weekends. However, things seemed to change for the better when information got to Jens, Anders' father, that Venke wasn't treating their son right. Upon learning this, Jens filed for Anders' custody, which Venke strongly fought against as she then decided to take full custody of Anders rather than having him in respite care. The case was pretty intense as both parents had even gotten their lawyers involved. However, it didn't take too long and the case was dropped. The National Center for Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, however, kept insisting that Anders had to be removed from Venke's care. As a matter of fact, the National Center had written a letter that Anders should be removed by force because they feared the worst if Anders was kept staying with Venke. In 1984, there was a hearing before the Municipal Committee for Child Welfare about whether or not Anders should be taken from his mother and placed under the foster system. Sadly, Child Welfare Services did not win the case, so Anders was left to remain with his mother, but with thorough supervision. However, the supervision only lasted three visits before it was discontinued. Following that, Anders was never placed in respite or foster care. From 1995 to 1998, Anders attended multiple schools. As a student, he was known to be very intelligent and was someone who stood up for others. Physically, Anders was stronger than many boys his age, so he was usually the go-to classmate whenever another classmate was being bullied. Anders lived with his elder half-sister, whom Venke had as a teenager, and his mother in Oslo, sometimes visiting his father and his second wife in France. This was until the two separated when Anders was 12. On the other hand, Venke got remarried again to a soldier in the Norwegian army. At age 15, Anders decided to carry out his confirmation in the Lutheran Church of Norway. But this decision is barely reflected in his moral choices. So one would wonder why. As an adolescent, Anders often acted out of rebellion. He joined a hip hop community in Oslo's West End and was also famous for his graffiti writing and painting. According to Venke, the first time Anders was caught by the police and fined for his unauthorized drawings on walls, Jens stopped communicating with his son. However, Jens had said that he didn't cut Anders off and that things happened the other way around. Eventually, Anders stopped being a part of the hip hop community in West Oslo after he and his best friend decided to go their separate ways. Over time, Anders began to be more expressive compared to how he was as a child. In his free time, he would go to the gym for weight training. Soon after, he began engaging in anabolic steroids. He was always conscious of his appearance and about how important it was for him to grow up to be big and strong. He also had his opinions on his mother's political position. In his teenage years, Anders often criticized his mother for supporting the Norwegian Labour Party and, according to him, for also being, as he called her, a moderate feminist. Later on, Anders joined the Norwegian army but was asked to leave shortly after, so he had zero military training. The Norwegian Defense Security Department had said that he wasn't fit for service after Anders had gone through all the necessary vetting and assessment processes. Anders then began working as a customer service representative in an unidentified company. He was 21 at this time. It was said that his job enabled him to work with people from different parts of the world and that he was very accommodating. On the other hand, his fellow workers had different things to say about him. While one described him as exceptional, Another said he was proud. As a result, no one really knew the next thing to expect from Anders. He seemed unpredictable. In 2002, Anders started a business for computer programming. The company had about six employees, and Anders supposedly made a million kroner when he was only 24, his very first million. 
It was in this same year that he began to formulate a plan of attack in Oslo. According to Anders, although he had lost 2 million kroner on stock speculation, he still had enough to carry out his attack. However, the computer programming company was declared bankrupt, eventually after Anders had reportedly breached the law a lot of times. After this series of misfortune, Anders decided to go back to his mother's so he could save money. In 2007, Anders declared assets were about 630,000 kroner. By 2008, he had about 2 million kroner and 9 credit cards. In May 2009, he started another company, a farming company under Breivik Geofarm. This farming company was built to grow vegetables, melons, roots, and tubers. In 2010, Anders visited Prague to purchase illegal weapons. However, he wasn't able to. He then decided that he would rather go through the legal process in Norway. First, he got a semi-automatic 9mm Glock 34 pistol legally, after declaring that he was a member of a gun club. He then got a semi-automatic Ruger Mini 14 rifle, this time through a hunting license. By 2009, Anders' assets together had gone below 400,000 kroner, and it got worse the year following that. In 2011, around late June, Anders moved to the site of his farm company. His farm company granted him access to the illegal possessions of fertilizers as well as other chemicals that were used to manufacture explosives. He used the nine credit cards he still had in his possession to fund everything else he needed for the attack. In 2011, July 22nd, Anders let off a fertilizer bomb in Oslo, in the residence of the office of the Prime Minister at the time. The bomb detonation took the lives of eight people. After this, Anders traveled to Utoya Island under the guise of a police officer. There, he began to fire gunshots sporadically, killing 69 people. In total, Anders took the lives of 77 people. The police tactical unit Delta in Oslo arrived at the island minutes later. After confronting Anders, he surrendered without any form of resistance. He was kept on the island for interrogation all through that night and was taken to a holding cell the next day. In February 2012, a pre-trial hearing was conducted in regard to Anders' case. On that day, Anders read a statement he had prepared asking for his release and also stating that he ought to be commended for his preemptive attack against traitors, which he said were trying to carry out a genocide. He said they are committing or planning to commit cultural destruction, including deconstruction of the Norwegian ethnic group and deconstruction of Norwegian culture. This is the same as ethnic cleansing. On April 16, 2012, Anders' trial began in Oslo Courthouse, and it was spearheaded by the Oslo District Court. The prosecution argued that at the time Anders carried out the attacks, he was mentally unstable. However, the court declared that he was sane, especially as he showed no remorse after his arrest. On the 24th of August 2012, Anders was found guilty of mass murder and being the mastermind of a bomb explosion and terrorism. He was sentenced to 21 years in prison, including a sentence to confinement, meaning that his prison sentence could be indefinitely extended if he still poses a threat to society. Anders did not appeal to a higher court, and on September 8th, Anders' sentence was deemed final. Under Norwegian law, after serving 10 years in prison, one was automatically eligible for parole. So in January 2022, Anders stood trial to find out whether he would be deemed eligible for parole. However, he lost since the court refused his plea. Thanks for tuning in to Twisted Minds. That was the case of Anders Baring Breivik. And why don't you go ahead and click on one of the two videos on your screen for another one of our videos.